The Buddha often talks about the practice of satipatthana, or the establishing of mindfulness, as a kind of protection. He says you make yourself a refuge when you practice the establishing of mindfulness. You make yourself an island, a safe place in the middle of a flood. There's also the passage where he tells the story of two acrobats. And as he said, as each of them maintains his or her sense of balance, each acrobat is protecting him or herself and also providing protection for the other. And then he says this is an analogy for the establishing of mindfulness. So what kind of protection does, does this provide? It's useful here to note that when the Buddha himself talked about a teacher providing protection for students, it's basically a matter of giving them clear reasons for what should and shouldn't be done. Because after all, we go through a life active. We're shaping our experience. We need guidance as to ways that will provide us with happiness in the long term and avoid suffering in the long term. But the main danger in life is our own lack of knowledge in this way, or our belief maybe that our actions don't matter, they have no results. That's really dangerous. That's a lot more dangerous than the dangers other people can pose to us. So this comes down to what you're doing with your mind right now. And establishing of mindfulness provides a really good protection here, because when you look at the three qualities that go into establishing mindfulness, ardency, alertness, and mindfulness, they're not just matters of accepting whatever comes up. When you look at the practice as a whole, mindfulness is what keeps in mind the ability to recognize things, the labels we have for naming things as they come up in the present moment. And once you've recognized what something is, it gives you a sense of what should and shouldn't be done with it. That's how your power of memory is a protector. Then there's alertness. Alertness watches what's actually happening. And you might say that it takes note of what's happening and then sends the information over to mindfulness. Mindfulness recognizes what's going on and then gives instructions as for what should be done. And finally, ardency is what does what should be done. If something is unskillful, and you recognize it as something unskillful, then you remember this is something you've got to get rid of. And mindfulness here remembers not only what you've read in the texts or heard from teachers, but also what you've learned on your own in your practice as to what works and what doesn't work. So these three qualities working together are what provide the real protection. Once ardency has done something well, or alertness notes that when it's done something not so well, alertness will note that too. Then you send that off to mindfulness to remember. So you want to strengthen these qualities as much as you can, because if you're missing any of them, you're left without protection. Now, in some cases, you can't recognize what's happening. In this case, your protection is to be really, really alert. Watch it for a while. Like Ajahn Mun's advice to Ajahn Mahabua. Something comes up in your meditation, you're not sure about it, watch it. Just stay with that sense of awareness, the observer, the knower. And don't come to any too quick conclusions. Until you see, okay, this is what's actually happening. Then you can recognize it as something skillful or unskillful, something to be developed or something to be abandoned. That's alertness over the long term. There's also alertness that has to be very quick. And this is about Sikaki's advice. You know, when something comes up in the meditation that seems really good, or an insight comes up that's really compelling, note what happens immediately after that. In other words, you've got to be alert. You don't just go riding with a sense of, say, pride or a sense of total conviction in the insight. Look and see what happens as a result. So there are times when alertness provides protection by being long-term, and other times it provides protection by being very quick. 
You can't really lack any of these three qualities. If you forget what you've learned from the past, you're totally defenseless. Or if you know things and what should be done but you don't carry it through, then you're not really protecting yourself either. So you have to work on these three qualities. And the problem is something comes up in the mind and we tend to think of it in our own vocabulary. Lust comes up and something good. Anger comes up and even though part of us may think that it's not all that good, another part of us really likes it. And this is where mindfulness has to be strong, the ability to recognize, okay, this is something you don't want to go with. And then reminding of the tools to deal with it, say, when lust comes up. The mind can create all kinds of reasons for why the object of the lust is really attractive, and what you want to do with it is something that should be done. And we very rarely see, okay, this is a hindrance. And if we follow through with it, it's going to create a lot of trouble. And so what do you do? Well, you need the tools to remind yourself, one, that lust is nothing you want to follow through with. It has its dangers. And here it's good to think about all the stupid things people do under the power of lust and the awful situations they get themselves into, getting tied up with a person they think is attractive and then discovering what else is there in that person. The person's background, personality, family, all the connections that get tied in with that person. And you realize how risky it is. Then you'd be a little bit more likely to want to actually apply, say, that meditation we had in the chant just now in the different parts of the body. First, think about your own body. What's there that's really worthy of lust? Take out all the parts and see which is something that would be really attractive. Then you do the same for the other person. This makes it fair. In other words, you're not saying the, the other sex or the other gender or the other person is the bad one or the disgusting one. Your body has the same sort of stuff. Now this analysis is going to work only if you have, as the Buddha says, an alternative source of pleasure. This is why we work with the breath. The two contemplations have to go together. Because many times you say, well, the pleasure that comes from the lust is, is really worth it. It's something you really need. You want your quick fix. This especially happens when you're tired or feeling stressed out. But if you can take a few minutes and just stop and breathe in a way that's really refreshing, really nourishing, you give yourself a lever, you give yourself some strength, you give yourself some food. That enables you to say, well, I really don't need that other kind of pleasure. So this is why ardency in developing concentration is your protection often against lust. As the Buddha said, you can know all the drawbacks of sensuality, but if you don't have an alternative form of pleasure, it's all that knowledge is not going to be worth anything. So ardency here also has to develop concentration, sense of well-being, work with the breath. We've talked for the past couple of days in the Q&A about different ways of working with the breath energy. And it's important to take some time to explore this aspect of your relationship to your body. What kind of movement of the breath is actually helpful? What kind of movement of the breath makes it more difficult to stay with the body? And learn to play. Take the body as your playground. Take the breath energy in the body as your playground here. And be open to new ideas about how the breath energy can move. We notice in John Lee's basic instructions, he talks about the breath energy going down the spine, down the legs, as you breathe in. Well, it can also do that as you breathe out. There are also times when he talks about breath energy starting in the soles of the feet, coming up the legs and up the spine, comes in the other direction. We read in manuals on Tai Chi, the circular part of the energy as you breathe in, there's a circle that goes up the front, up the back, down the front, down the back, whichever way you want the energy to go, in a circle from the, the head down through the 
spot between the legs and then back up the spine. There are lots of different ways you can work with the energy. And don't let yourself be limited, because the more variety you can find in dealing with the breath, the more intriguing it will be to be with the body, and the more able you will be to find a sense of well-being for the body for just what it needs at that particular time. And this allows you to step back, stay from whatever got you angry or wherever the lust was. And you can look at the, the other physical symptoms and the mental symptoms that you put together to create that lustful state or put together to create that angry state. Because these things are things that we fabricate. We're really good at putting them together. A little sensation here, a little sensation there, and you tie it together and say, this is it, lust is overcoming me. I've got all this pressure inside. I've got to do something about it. The same with anger. This person did that. Well, they did this, and then they did this. You can stitch it together into a big story and get your blood boiling. There's a report recently on how people with strong bouts of anger are more likely to have a heart attack a couple hours later. And it's interesting, the researchers said they didn't know what the connection was. Well, it's all pretty obvious. But we stitch these things together out of little random sensations here and there. And the mind has learned to be really good at this. And we've been doing this for who knows how many lifetimes. If you have a sense of well-being from the breath, then you can step back from these fabrications and begin to take them apart. What was the sensation? What was the first sensation in the body? What was the first little thought in the mind? What little whisper of thought suggested that lust might be a good antidote for whatever sense of irritation you're feeling, or that anger would be an appropriate response for what someone's done. And then how did that work its way into the bureaucracy, influencing this person, that person inside? You've got all these committee members working together, creating little sensations here and there, and all of a sudden you've got a full-blown case. Now, if you want to believe the propaganda of that case, you're throwing away your protection. Your protection is to remind yourself, okay, this is an unskillful state, and you have to be alert. One of the things you remember with mindfulness is if you stay with the body, stay with the breath in particular, you're going to be here in the present moment. So when these things happen, you'll see them, and you'll be alert to up-and-coming trends. And if you see this is going in a bad direction, you can start doing something about it. This is how these three qualities keep spinning around, working to give you the protection you need from things like lust, aversion, delusion, greed, all the other things that come welling up inside and that you've been so good at creating and then create so many dangers for yourself. So this is why when John Lee was writing about the establishing of mindfulness. He kept hammering away at these three points, these three qualities. Mindfulness, alertness, ardency. Because they lie at the essence of how the establishing of mindfulness can provide you with protection. It can be your refuge, be your island in the middle of the river. Or as they say in another passage in the canon, your island in the middle of a lake. The lake is rising, but you've got this island that keeps you from drowning in the lake. So don't abandon it. Think of that image of the, the quail being hunted by the hawk. As long as the quail is in its safe property, the hawk can't get it. As soon as you wander out, and what, what does it mean to wander out? It would go into Fascination with sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, all the raw material for things like passion and aversion. Then the hawk can get you. But if you stay in your proper territory, the establishing of mindfulness, you're safe. Of course, it's not just a place, it's a combination of activities here in the mind. They're your protectors. So nourish them well.